Melbourne. The Australian city, well known for its vibrant culture, four seasons in a day, and of course, its coffee. With a range of accolades, including the world's most livable city seven years in a row, and the world's third most livable city in 2023, statistics will tell you there is a lot to love about this place. And I'm not here to disagree, because personally, I love the city for all of the right reasons. But what if I told you that, no matter where you are, monsters live among us? Today, we're trying something new and slightly different for Coffeehouse Crime, by exploring several cases which occurred all across Melbourne. This is the beginning of a new series, one that covers the darkest corners of our most beloved cities. Join me today as I explore the morbid underbelly of Melbourne, Australia. Before I begin and just let you know that I cover true crime and darkly fascinating stories, so if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, let's grab our shoes, grab a coffee to go, and explore Melbourne's dark side. Welcome to Melbourne, folks. So, with a personal connection so strong, how would I describe this city? If I had to sum it up in just one word, I would say blended. And that's because almost every aspect of this city is chaotically combined with charm. Modern skyscrapers are blended behind old Victorian buildings. Hot and sunny afternoons are blended with sporadic showers. And almost every type of food you can think of can easily be found within walking distance. And so, when I say that this city is for everyone, I sincerely mean it. Melbourne will charm you with its many laneways, beautiful suburbs, and cosy architecture. And of course, it's well known for its great food, and it's great coffee. I'm here at Light Up Coffee in South Melbourne, and I have to say, this suburb really does have it good. With more brunch spots than days in the year, I don't think I could ever eat my way through all of them. Now, I'm often asked what my favorite coffee is, and I have to say it's the flat white. Interesting fact, but did you know that Australia invented the flat white? Apparently, back in the 1980s, some random guy wanted something between a latte and an espresso. Fast forward 40 years, and it's now one of the most popular coffees to date. Enough about coffee today though, our story today takes us 10 miles north of here to a suburb named Brunswick, and it's about a woman who left her life in Ireland to start one down under, and her name was Jill Mayer. Born on October the 30th, 1982, to her parents George and Edith McKeon, Jill grew up in Drogheda, located in northeastern Ireland. She grew up in a tiny village in a small family of four, alongside her brother Michael. Jill was always known to be a happy-go-lucky child, was always seen smiling, and played with all of the neighbouring kids. And the neighbourhood combined knew her as a little Irish beauty. However, the young girl would find herself thrust into a very different lifestyle style when she was just nine years old, when her father, George, was reassigned to work in the Western Australian city of Perth. From here, she attended Bull Creek Primary School before graduating from Rossamoyne High School. Much like in Ireland, Jill was popular and made many friends in Perth with her keeping in touch with many of them while she grew up. After six years of employment in 1996, her father moved the family back to Ireland, where Jill continued her studies. And after graduating college back in Ireland, Jill would pursue a Bachelor of Arts at the University College of Dublin. Moving forward, her parents moved back to Perth in 2004, when Jill herself was 22. Jill took all of this international moving in her stride, one of the many reasons her future husband, Tom Ma was attracted to her. The couple never seemed to have a problem, and Tom was smitten with his partner. After graduating, the pair often travelled between Ireland and Australia, frequently visiting both Perth and Melbourne, with Jill travelling for her work in the fashion industry. The pair eventually married in 2008 in Ireland, before taking the plunge and permanently moving to Melbourne in 2009. From here on out, the newlyweds would build a very comfortable life together, with Jill finding permanent work at the Australian broadcasting company known as ABC. And so, the couple settled into a very happy life together, often travelling to Perth and Ireland to see their many friends and family. They were absolutely smitten with each other, happy with their budding lifestyle, and loved their jobs and colleagues, many of whom Jill was close to. Jill spent many weekends away with her gal pals, and would often meet up for coffee or a few drinks after finishing work, visiting the many bars and restaurants that Melbourne is famous for. 
Things were no different on September the 21st, when Jill and a few of her colleagues decided to have a couple of drinks after work. And taking the distinctive Melbourne tram, they ended up in the inner suburb of Brunswick. It is here on this vibrant street named Sydney Road that the group headed to a little bar and garden named the Brunswick Green. Following an evening together, Jill and her colleagues shared happy conversations over drinks and snacks. The group then moved on to Bar Etiquette, which could also be found along Sydney Road, but sadly has since closed down. Now Jill, she didn't live too far away from this very street right here, and so she had no worries in travelling home alone. And so, with that in mind, she stayed out to around 1am that night with her friends, before eventually making her way home, where her husband was waiting for her. While on the way home, Jill called her brother, Michael. Sadly, their father had fallen ill after having a stroke. Within this phone call, Jill sounded both serious and collected, so it's safe to assume that she was relatively sober and had her wits about her. Shortly after after this, she ended the call, returning home in isolation. Back at home, things were getting a little late for Jill's husband, Tom. It was now later than when she said she would be home, which was beginning to worry him. And so, shortly after 2am, he tried to call her, but strikingly, he was met with silence. In a panic, he called Jill's family, and that is when her brother confirmed that she was already on her way home a while ago. This further ignited Tom's fear, and so, blinded with worry, he decided to go out and look for her. Four long, gruelling hours passed, and Tom spent all of them driving around Brunswick and its surrounding suburbs, searching high and low for his wife. But sadly, with no luck, he then handed her disappearance to the authorities. Police were on the case fast, with Jill's family and friends actively working with officers to find her as quick as possible. But sadly, all of their efforts were to no avail, and three days later, they were still met with silence. As the police searched for her, Jill's friends took to social media to begin an online campaign, using the hashtag HelpUsFindJillMar on Facebook and Twitter. And although this Facebook page is now defunct, it amassed more than 100,000 followers in only four days of searching. And on Twitter, you can still see many desperate pleas for her safety. Data forensic teams could roughly trace Jill's movements using her mobile phone data, and sadly, the results were worrying. As we know, Jill left the bar at roughly 1.40am in the relatively central suburb of Brunswick. And although the signal would show that she got relatively close to home, she then then began to veer off track at speed. Her phone appeared to travel northwest, driving by Tullamarine Airport and then Sunbury, before finally arriving in the isolated town of Gisborne. By now, the public had become well aware of Jill's disappearance, and many were worried that this may transpire to be a homicide. A break would soon come for the authorities when they found Jill's handbag here on Hope Street, just a stone's throw away from the bar she was last seen at. However, what was strange is that the authorities had already searched the street in the hours after her disappearance, so none of this made any sense to the investigation. It turns out that a local shopkeeper had actually found the bag just after her disappearance, but after hearing about her on the news, he panicked and returned it to where he found it. Now, it is confirmed that this is usually the route that Jill would have taken home, and so finding her bag here made total sense. Worryingly, forensic experts would also realise a flat patch of earth near where the bag was found, which sadly can often indicate sexual assault. Homicide squad detectives have taken over the investigation into missing person Gillian Ma. Gillian was last seen at Bar Etiquette in Sydney Road, Brunswick, in the early hours of Saturday morning. She has not been sighted since. This morning, a handbag was located in the laneway off Hope Street in Brunswick, and we've recently confirmed that the contents of that handbag belong to Gillian. So we're appealing for anyone that may be able to help us with regard to Gillian's disappearance. We're particularly interested to hear from anyone from Bar Etiquette that may have seen Gillian in the early hours of Saturday morning or walking along Sydney Road in Brunswick. With this information now available to the public, local businesses in the area scoured their surveillance cameras with more scrutiny, desperately searching for any sign of Jill or what may have happened to her. That is when, the very next day, after the discovery of her bag, 
a glimmer of hope and fear came in the form of surveillance footage. On the northern end of Sydney Road, and just around the corner from Hope Street where Jill's bag was found, a surveillance camera captured what is known to be her last recorded sighting. This shop behind me, formerly known as the Duchess Boutique, captured this surveillance footage. Since then, the company's moved due to unwanted attention and since then is once again up for sale. The surveillance footage shows the view from a camera pointing out the front window of the old store. A man in a blue hoodie can be seen walking by, which initially is nothing unusual. But what is strange is that this camera records him going back and forth and back again. The camera then captures a glimpse of a young woman walking by, resembling Jill on the night that she disappeared. And worryingly, she appears to be talking to this man in the blue hoodie. They briefly stop for a moment, where Jill then appears to show the man something on her phone. It is assumed that maybe he was asking her for directions. That is when they both end up walking the same way. Combining all of this evidence currently available, it became evident to the authorities that this was now a potential case of assault and even possibly homicide. Jill's movements could be traced from the Brunswick Green, heading north on Sydney Road before turning into Hope Street, where her bag was then found adjacent to Oven Street, and the camera which recorded the surveillance footage was directly on that pathway. But this case required further forensic investigation to help blow the case wide open, and thankfully, a team of forensic officers had already been hard at work in the background. Using the digital trail left behind by Jill's phone, they checked all available surveillance footage from public and private allotments. And fortunately for them, this cat and mouse investigation revealed one car that was consistently present throughout the journey. The vehicle was captured along Sydney Road and Hope Street, where Jill was last seen. But what was odd is that this was at 4.17am, that being almost three hours after she was caught on camera. The vehicle was then spotted again at a Sunbury gas station, which can be found halfway towards Gisborne where Jill's phone was last detected. In this footage, the driver could be spotted wearing a beanie and a blue hoodie similar to the one in the shop's surveillance footage. Furthermore, it wasn't hard to identify the man behind the vehicle's wheel, and that's because he was already well acquainted with local officers for all of the wrong reasons. And this man's name was Adrian Ernest Bailey. And so, on September the 27th, 2012, the authorities decided to pay Adrian a little visit. After knocking on the front door of his house in Coburg, he was arrested on the spot on suspicion of involvement in Jill's disappearance. But who precisely was this 41-year-old man? And why were the authorities so sure that he was potentially responsible for Jill's silence? Well, unfortunately, they did have valid doubts, because, to put it bluntly, this man was an utter monster. Adrian's criminal history began in the year 1990 at the age of 19 years old, when, during this time frame, he attacked a girl who was waiting at a bus stop. Now, thankfully, she did manage to get away from him before he could pin her down, but his failure here would not dissuade him in the future. Later that very same year, he then attempted to sexually assault a 16-year-old hitchhiker. After being arrested, he pleaded guilty to both cases, and was sentenced to five years in prison, with a minimum of three years to be served. However, for one outlandish reason or another, he was then released in 1993, after serving a measly 22 months months for his crimes. And as far as we know, he then behaved himself for the next seven years. That would be until the turn of the new millennium. In the year 2000, in the beautiful coastal suburb of St Kilda, evil was afoot once again. Adrian was on the prowl. It has to be said, but I hate sharing a name with this guy. It is very rare to find another Adrian in this world, and of course, it has to be with this head. St Kilda is well known for its beautiful beaches, Luna Park and its shopping strip. On that strip, you can find many cafes and restaurants, filled with tourists and young adults alike. But Adrian would leave a scar in this community when five women, many of them prostitutes, came forward to accuse him of assault. Eventually, in the year 2002, he was found guilty of eight counts of sexual assault, and was sentenced to 11 years behind bars, with a minimum of eight. Adrian would only serve the minimum sentence and be released in 2010, and two years later, 
he then met his next documented victim, Jill Ma. With Adrian confessing to his previous crimes, we can only assume that he would do the same thing for Jill's disappearance, and you would be correct in believing this. Adrian would ultimately fold during his interrogation, which took place over several hours led by Detective Paul Rowe. Now, initially, Adrian played a helpful and innocent character. He first claimed that he and his girlfriend had gone out to a bar, but after arguing over trivial matters, he returned home to spend the night alone. However, with the surveillance footage at hand, detectives knew that this story was a lie. To Adrian, it seemed like he'd gotten away with it using his carefree attitude. But after being slowly presented with various articles of evidence, he realised that things were not so easy. Of course, with this evidence ranging from him talking to Jill, to his journey out of the suburbs towards Sunbury and Gisborne. As more and more evidence stacked up, Adrian's demeanour progressively changed. He became more quiet, defensive, and even dumbfounded. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when he was presented with Jill Ma's SIM card, which was found in a warranted search of his home. When asked where it came from, all Adrian could repeat was, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain it. I don't want to explain it. Adrian broke down and began to sob. And in true narcissistic fashion, his interview suddenly became all about him, about how he wanted to get things off his chest, and how he was a good person. And that is when the truth finally came pouring out. Adrian told detectives that he assaulted Jill after she had rebuffed his advances towards her. He claimed that after touching her, she slapped him, and that is when he saw red. He pushed her down, assaulted her, and then, when she told him she'd be calling the police, he silenced her by pressing down on her neck. And although she tried to fight back, Adrian was sadly far stronger than she was. He then left the scene, drove back to his home in Coburg to collect a shovel, and returned at 4.17am. That of course being when his car was caught by a camera entering the laneways. He then loaded her into the trunk, took her body to Gisborne, and buried her in a shallow grave. Paul appealed to his honesty with compassion, and on September the 28th, 2012, Adrian agreed to show them where Jill was. It turns out that she had been buried in a grave close to where her phone last pinged. And so, in the end, detectives were correct with their investigation. Forensic pathologists would also confirm that the cause of her death was compression of the neck, and that, furthermore, they could find lacerations all across her body. With all of the evidence that they needed, he was now formally arrested for the assault and murder of Jill Ma and placed into police custody. Shortly after, he would make a feeble attempt to take his own life, but was unsuccessful. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, Adrian would have the nerve to try to contend his case and claim innocence. In this, he tried to play the well-meaning victim who never meant to harm Jill. However, it soon became apparent that the evidence against him was simply way too strong. And so, in April of 2013, and in a desperate plea to reduce his future sentence, Adrian Bailey pleaded guilty to the rape and murder of Jill Ma. Later that month, he pleaded not guilty to three other separate charges of assault on other women. Which, by the way, is only three of the twenty that were publicly known at the time. Now, much to Adrian's dismay, when his pre-sentencing hearing took place, the judge lifted the suppression order on his previous convictions. This meaning that his prior convictions could be revealed and considered when deliberating his sentence. This information spread like wildfire, causing a surge in the public's desire to see the man rot behind bars for the rest of his life. And so, finally, in June of 2013, Adrian Ernest Bailey was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for 35 years. However, the final nail in the coffin was yet to come for him, because two years later, three more women came forward to claim that they were assaulted by him. These three new charges increased his sentence by an additional 18 years, and further forced his parole back from 35 to 43. This means that Adrian will only be eligible for parole at the ripe old age of 95, making it highly unlikely that he will ever see the light of day again. As a direct result of Jill Mar's case, laws against parolees in Victoria were tightened quite significantly. 
Okay, in effect, Jill has now saved countless other women from reoffending dirtbags. But sadly, this information comes with poison. It's a tragedy to know that her story had to happen for these changes to be made. This case is one that shook Melbourne to its very core. Jill's name could be found all over the news, both here in Australia and back at home in the UK. Many women who formerly felt safe in this beautiful city temporarily lost all sense of security. It was only after Adrian was convicted that their confidence was restored. Interesting fact, but in the year 2021, Melbourne was ranked to be the eighth safest city in the world. Still, that doesn't mean that anyone is ever safe from a monster with a motive. Jill Mayer fell in love with the city for all of the reasons that I have too, and with its vibrant, friendly, and cultural background, it fit her personality perfectly. Now, some of you will remember that around two years ago, I covered the case of Sarah Kafferke and her killer, Stephen Hunter. Interesting fact, but Stephen and Adrian beat the shit out of each other in prison just last year. I guess you could say that monsters seldom get along with each other. Although Adrian was stopped in his tracks after murdering Jill, sometimes others aren't caught quickly enough. And sadly, that would be the case for Melbourne's most notorious serial killer. Now, for this story, I first have to take you beachside. The southern suburbs of Melbourne are home to extraordinary beaches, sprightly high streets, and some of the best markets that I've ever come across. You have the likes of St Kilda, Elwood, and then Malvern. Stretching further down the coast brings you to Brighton, and further afar, down to the suburb of Frankston, where our next story takes place. Frankston can be found around 25 miles south of Melbourne, and in its previous years was considered to be one of the roughest suburbs to live in. This was usually due to petty crimes such as theft, burglary, and the occasional bar fight. Well, I say occasionally, but it's more like a Friday night ritual here. Although this is what Frankston was previously known for, the council has since tried to improve its reputation in and around town. One of its most scenic areas is right here at Frankston Pier which has recently been voted one of Melbourne's cleanest beaches. However, if you cast yourself back to the 90s, you'd be rather shocked to realise how far this destination has come in recent decades. In fact, today, we'll be visiting that bygone era and turning the clocks back all the way to 1993, when there was one gripping thing on all of the locals' radar. And of course, I'm talking about murder. It was a year where terror swept across the area of Frankston and Seaford. A series of disturbing events would occur over the space of several months, but they would only find out who was behind them after the lives of three innocent people were taken. We begin this story in February of 1993 between both of these two towns, where a woman living next to the train station of Kananook on Claude Street reported a very chilling incident. The household comprised of Donna Vanes, her husband, and their newborn child. She had previously contacted the police over several mysterious and threatening phone calls being made to her landline, which eventually worried her so much that she was too scared to go anywhere alone. Becoming so frightened by the anonymous calls, Donna asks her husband if she and the baby could stay with him while he delivered pizzas. Just one hour later, the family returned home, and they were met with an agonizingly horrific scene. Blood covered the kitchen floor, and upon closer inspection, they found the body of their cat. Tragically, it had been violently murdered. A pornographic image had been placed on its lifeless body with the words, Donna, you are dead, written in blood. The horror didn't stop there. In the bathroom, police discovered two dead kittens in the bathtub, and in the bedroom, more explicit images had been pasted over the wardrobe. Even the innocent bed of their newborn baby wasn't safe. Inside of it was yet another explicit image. Understandably, this terrified the family beyond all measures. After this incident, they wanted nothing to do with the apartment, deciding to move out that very night. As a result, they moved in with Donna's sister nearby, but little did they know that the evil they were trying to escape was now far closer than ever before. Although no human in this situation was hurt, 
it did seem obvious to the police that they were dealing with an extremely dangerous individual. And unfortunately, just a few months later, another terrible incident occurred. On June the 11th of that same year, a family called the authorities after their relative from overseas had gone missing. The family were searching for an 18-year-old student named Elizabeth Stevens. At the time of her disappearance, she had moved to Melbourne from Tasmania and was staying with her aunt and uncle. And now with her missing for several hours, her family, both near and far, were growing worried. Sadly, all efforts to find Elizabeth would be in vain. Instead, her body was found here in Lloyd Park Reserve by a man who was collecting branches. Tragically, she was found only 250 metres from her home in this beautiful park. Her body had been covered in bushland. It was obvious from the outset that Elizabeth was dead. She had been strangled, her throat had been cut, and she had multiple stab wounds across her body. Witnesses reported seeing her walking hand in hand with a man the evening prior, assuming that he was her partner. Only, unknown to them at the time, she was actually single. Now, it is possible that she was threatened and forced to hold the man's hand under direct order, eliciting the facade of a relationship that would not concern others nearby. Regardless, and sadly, it was all too late to save Elizabeth. Her death traumatised her family and friends, and left the community of Frankston in fear. Just one month later, in the early evening of July the 8th, a local was driving by Seaford North Reserve when a visibly panicked woman ran onto the road and flagged him down. She claimed to have been attacked by an armed gunman and urgently needed help. The woman's name was Roger Toth, and once she was back at her home, she called the police immediately. With Roger having a similar profile to Elizabeth, and it being in the same area as her murder, the authorities believed that the same killer must have conducted this. And this incident would become even more worrying when a second call came through later that very same evening. Another woman failed to return home after popping out to buy some milk. And with a 12-day-old baby back at home, the father was desperately worried. The missing woman, named Deborah Freem, was reported to the police within the hour. However, tragically, all search efforts to find her alive would be in vain. And just four days later, on July the 12th, her body was discovered by a farmer on Taylor's Road in Carrum Downs, that being a short drive from Frankston and Seaford. It appeared that the local authorities had a killer with a distinct drive for violence towards women on their hands. Within just a few months, the towns had experienced two murders and several other terrifying incidents. A wave of speculation and fear coasted the beachside community. A public warning was announced, and fear was spread far and wide amongst the public. And with so much at stake, the pressure was on for local authorities to track, find, and then end Frankston's new killer. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, the authorities were not quick enough to stop whoever was behind these attacks, because on the evening of July the 30th, 1993, yet another phone call came through. A 17-year-old student named Natalie Russell was reported as missing. She was last seen walking home from John Paul College, found behind me, when she suddenly vanished. Witnesses reported seeing her walk along this fenced pathway back towards Frankston North Station, which was her typical walk back home. Her disappearance was very concerning to officers. Not only did her profile match previous victims, but the location did too. With that in mind, officers realised that they may be dealing with a newly emerging serial killer. The Frankston serial killer was born. And with that said, the community around Frankston started to grow with fear. And so, an extensive search operation to find Natalie officially began. Detectives started their investigation at three basic points of interest, that being her school, the station, and her home. After interviewing those who worked at the station, they determined that she likely never arrived to catch her train, meaning that the authorities could concentrate their efforts between the school and the station. It didn't take long for detectives to find rather concerning clues along the fenced walkway that led towards that station. 
Hamilton. Running between two golf courses on Sky Road, the walkway was lengthy and far from surrounding neighbourhoods. And furthermore, most of the path was surrounded by bushes and trees. Officers soon found a sizeable hole along the fence line, which was big enough for an adult to fit through. It seemed that the bush through the hole had been disturbed, with branches snapped and foliage nearby appeared to be slightly flattened. And upon closer inspection, detectives noticed that three holes had been cut along different areas of the same fence line, all of which had been cut using the same tool. And then came the morbid clues. One of those holes contained skin, blood, and hair. After entering the hole, officers made a horrific discovery. Just metres away from the track, in a small clearing of shrubbery, lay the body of Natalie Russell. Similar to previous victims, she had been sexually assaulted, and her throat had been cut. Police now had a third victim on their hands, but this one was different. Natalie had put up a tremendous fight against her assailant, meaning that this time, they were able to collect DNA samples of the killer's hair, skin, and blood. Meanwhile, the detectives who also covered the initial break-in and the assault against Roger Toth now had more information to work with. Rosha described her aggressor as being about 20 years old, tall, with a round face and blue eyes. And although this is now a somewhat archaic practice, police drew up a profile of their suspected killer to be distributed to the public. Side note, but this method is seldom used nowadays as it can give people a false impression of the murderer, and furthermore, can give the killer a heads up to change their appearance if they feel they need to do so. The authorities were on the lookout for a young adult male, likely unemployed or with a menial job, who lived alone in the local area and was likely average looking. They also conducted an extensive door-knocking campaign with this information, visiting over 47 homes in the local area. At the time, this was the most extensive door-knocking campaign in the history of the state of Victoria, but despite their efforts, it would end with nothing. But finally, authorities had a lead. It's just tragic that it took Natalie's death for one to come through. At 2.30pm on the day of Natalie's disappearance, a postal worker spotted a yellow rusty Toyota Corolla near this fenced walkway in Frankston. The postie also noticed a man using binoculars in the area, and with this happening at a time before mobile phones were regularly available, he then walked to the local police station to report this strange behaviour. After arriving, the authorities determined the car's licence plate, However, none of the neighbours knew who this car belonged to. Not that they needed their input, because later that day, they were quick to trace the car's owner. And that is when they learned of the name Paul Charles Danyar. And so, on July the 31st, 1993, officers made their way to his apartment on Frankston Dandenong Road, which is only one mile away from where Natalie disappeared. After arriving and knocking at the unit, police were greeted by a woman who just happened to be Paul's girlfriend at the time. Paul was polite and pleasant, and even invited officers inside. His demeanour gave them no reason to be suspicious or concerned. But upon closer inspection, the officers noticed that Paul's hands were dirty and covered in cuts. Officers asked Paul what he was doing near the location of Natalie's murder, to which he had no distinct answer for them. Next, they asked him what he'd been up to during the time Elizabeth and Deborah were murdered. But again, he was unable to comment with any sort of precision. The lack of information from Paul was worrying to the officers, and sadly, it wouldn't stop there. After interviewing several of his neighbours, many reported burglaries which were similar to the initial one seen at the Vane's residence, but thankfully, without as much bloodshed. Speaking of the Vane's family, it turned out that Donna Vane's sister lived in the same block of flats as Paul Denya, meaning that Donna, her husband, and their newborn child unknowingly moved substantially closer to the man who had threatened them. And so, with many leads pointing towards 21-year-old Paul Denya, he was taken into police custody for questioning. But who precisely was this strange and rather suspicious man? 
Paul Charles Denyer was born on April 4, 1972, to his British immigrant parents, Anthony and Maureen Denyer. He grew up in Campbelltown, found on the outskirts of Sydney, before moving to Victoria for his father's work in 1981, meaning he made the move at nine years old. Now, many say that this move took its toll on Paul's mental health as a child, as he never really assimilated into his new surroundings once moving to Melbourne. But personally, as someone who moved from the US to the UK as a child, I'm calling bullshit on this excuse. Anyway, for the sake of what is reported, Paul never really fit in with the other kids, leading to him failing all of his grades while facing a forever dwindling self-confidence. This change in scenery was the beginning of Paul's downfall. From here onwards, he began to exhibit extremely concerning behaviour. To begin with, at the tender age of 11, he slashed his sister's teddy bear's throat right in front of her eyes. And although this may seem harmless enough, the next step would not be. That very same year, and still at the incredibly young age of just 11 years old, he slashed the family cat's throat and then hung it from a tree. By 13, he was arrested for stealing a car, and by 15, he was arrested and charged for assaulting a classmate. After graduating from high school, Paul tried his hand in various jobs, but was fired from all of them due to poor attendance, terrible behavior, and laziness. And all of this brings us to the year 1993, where Paul was 21, unemployed, and suspected of murdering three innocent women. And with so many questions in mind, his interrogation began the very day he was arrested. Let me tell you, this interview was a strange one to say the least. Paul was caught out on multiple questions, making it abundantly clear that the truth was far from the story he had formulated in his mind, and also indicating that he may have something to do with the recent murders of these local women. For example, when the interview began, detectives highlighted that his hands were covered in cuts, and, as I've mentioned, blood was found on the jagged fencing at the scene of Natalie's murder. Continuing, I must inform you that you're not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? Yeah. What is your age and date of birth? I'm 21 years old. I was born on the 14th of April 1972. Okay. Are you an Australian citizen? Yep. Are you currently employed? No, I'm unemployed at the present time. All we'd like to do, Paul, is if you could just run through, um, starting with yesterday morning, I got up in the morning about 20 to 8, 7.30, 20 to 8. Right. As I was coming down, say, past Karingal Drive, mm -hmm. I noticed temperature gauge started to go right up to high. So I just pulled over and in Sky it's Road. Road yeah. And right across the road is, you know, your golf course and, yeah. and everything. So I pulled up there and I checked under the car, under the bonnet, and found out the hose could come loose. When we saw you down at your flat this afternoon, mm. I noticed a number of cuts on your fingers. Yeah. Can you just um, put your hands flat on the desk here, so that um, just right up here. This injury here is a long uh, sort of a cut. Just explain how you got that injury and when you got that injury. I got it yesterday and I was working on the car. What, how are you saying it occurred? Well, the fan spins this way, yeah. so if I'm standing in the front of the car, yeah. like here, fan yeah. spins that way, the alternator sits there, yeah. and there's some wires running down underneath the bottom of the radiator, there's a wire at the top, mm. which was for a light that I just recently put on, and it must have been when I was putting my hand down there, I caught the fan. <clears throat> Why did you have it running uh, at that stage, when you were checking the well, radiator? Clumsy worker. The most disturbing detail about this is that, upon closer inspection of his hands, his fingernails were still brown with what appeared to be dried blood under them, this potentially being a trophy to the grisly murder which took place. Tragically, anyone examining the crime scene of Natalie's murder would have agreed that it would have been almost impossible for her assailant not to be covered in her blood. What's even more puzzling and out of place is when Paul was asked what he was doing on the days of these murders, he could now accurately recall every single hour of the day. This included what he was up to and why, which was suspicious to investigators, as this was not a usual response in the interrogation room. After all, if those three days were just like any other, then why would you mentally note everything that had happened in such great detail? Yesterday, your car was parked opposite the location where the body of Natalie Russell was found. 
Mm. On the night that Debbie Freem disappeared, you walked over to Kennedale Railway Station, missed the train and walked back. Mm. And on the night Elizabeth Stevens mm. disappeared, you walked in a very close proximity to Lloyd Park on your way to pick up this battery. Do you think that's fairly coincidental yeah, um, it is. in, in all, the, all the circumstances? Yeah. Are you responsible for the deaths of any of these women? No. As you can probably tell from Paul's deafening silence when asked if he had anything to do with these murders, he was internally debating if he was in too deep to make it out of custody. I mean, he had even consented to his DNA being taken and compared to that found at the crime scene, so he kind of knew that the game was already over. At this point in the interrogation, the leading detective left the room and left Paul to his own spiralling thoughts. Before doing so, he showed absolute compassion by offering the man coffee, and anything else that he might want. And this was when Paul realised that it was all over for him. With regret, he reluctantly confessed to his own deplorable actions. He spoke to Detective O'Loughlin here, and um, you uh, told Detective O'Loughlin that you were responsible for the murders of the three, the three women. Is that correct? Just tell us in your own words, Paul, what happened in relation to the death of Elizabeth Stevens at Lang Warren. I saw her get off the bus, and I walked up behind her, stuck my left hand around it, ran her mouth like this, and held her a gun on my head right here. I started choking her with my hands, and, uh, she passed out after a while, and then I pulled out the knife, okay. and I dragged her to where she was found. Then I threw two branches on her body. Can you tell me why you attacked her on that night? Just, just had, just had the feeling. That's all. Where, what sort of feeling? Can you? Possibly describe it, where, where you had this feeling? Just wanted... Just wanted to kill. After this damning and finite confession, Paul was more than willing to recount the murders in excruciating detail, including how, when, and why he committed these crimes. In short, it seemed that he had a burning desire to kill women. He also showed the investigators exactly where he attacked his victims, recounted his actions in great detail, and talked as if he was both excited and detached from the crime itself. Paul Denyer showed no remorse or empathy as he recalled his behaviour, a telltale sign of someone with a variation or kind of emotional personality disorder. And alongside admitting to the murders, he also admitted to the attack on Russia Toth on the same night he murdered Debbie, saying that if she hadn't got away, she almost certainly would have met the same fate as the other women. These women were not his only victims. Paul went on to admit that he had been stalking women around the Frankston area for multiple years years already. Furthermore, he found gratification in tormenting women and making them feel scared. Now, we can only assume that Paul had been doing this for six or seven years already. In addition to this, he also confessed that he'd harboured the urge to kill someone since he was just 14 years old. In total, Paul Denyer's interrogation lasted for approximately five hours. Now, this may sound emotionally taxing, but this wasn't very long considering he had to cover three separate murders, one assault, and his morbid history. In fact, during his interrogation, Paul talked about women with great disdain and hatred. It was evident that, for one reason or another, he held a lot of anger towards them, which is a remarkably worrying observation when considering he had a girlfriend at the time. 
On December the 20th, 1993, after four days of hearings, Paul Denyer was officially charged with three counts of murder and one abduction, all of which he did not deny in court. It seemed that he had succumbed to his fate and accepted the consequences of his actions. Psychologists observed that Paul lacked any emotions regarding his crimes and had a single-minded desire to kill. This eventually led to a diagnosis of sadistic personality disorder, but was not a legally classed insanity. Paul's forensic psychologist would go on to say he found intentional maltreatment of victims to be insanely gratifying, taking pleasure in torment, anguish, distress, hopelessness, and suffering of the victim. In contrast to simple anger, the behaviour of sadistic personality is fully premeditated. He is not suddenly exploding with rage. The more aggressive he became, the more powerful he felt. Melbourne Supreme Court sentenced Paul to three consecutive life sentences with no option for parole. Despite this, just 11 days later, he lodged an appeal which was eventually addressed several months later. I wish I could say that this was denied, but unfortunately, his appeal worked. Ignoring the fact that he sadistically murdered three young women and multiple cats, he was granted the possibility of parole after 30 years behind bars, meaning he would have been eligible for release just last year in 2023. During his time in prison, Paul underwent a change of identity and quite the transformation. Ten years into a sentence and in the year 2003, he revealed that he wanted to transition to female. Stating in one of his written letters, I committed these disgusting crimes not because I hated womankind, but because I never felt that I was male. Paul, now named Paula, began to wear women's clothing and cosmetics in prison, although he was advised not to for quite obvious reasons. Medical professionals evaluated Paula and found that she was not viable for gender reassignment surgery as they did not believe this transition was genuine. Eventually, Paula was would revert back to identifying as Paul shortly after his initial transition. Many believe this was just a stunt to gain access to a safer and more relaxed prison environment, so he could be placed either in a woman's prison or in his own confinement. Now personally, I find it quite sickening for a man who abused and murdered multiple women in some of the most horrific ways possible to believe that they could simply become one instead. Now as mentioned, Paul Denyer became eligible for parole just like last year, and, no surprise, applied for release. Thankfully, this was denied, and he still resides in Port Phillip Prison to this very day. This came as a relief to the families of his victims, as, to this day, they still believe he should never see the light of day again. These three women never deserved the fate that fell upon them. Each of them had most of their lives ahead of them, and had aspirations and dreams moving forward. And tragically, they lost their lives in one of the most terrifying ways possible. Elizabeth Stevens travelled to Melbourne to seek further education and better herself so that she could eventually join the armed services. Deborah Freem was a loving new mother who left the house to provide for her growing family. And Natalie Natalie Russell, an aspirational student innocently walking home from college who fought against her assailant bravely. The deaths of these three women have left a hole in three grieving families and dozens of friends, all of whom still remember them to this day. Natalie's tragic death allowed the authorities to find, charge and convict a dangerous serial killer with violent and sadistic tendencies. No doubt, without her, he would have gone on to kill countless other women. We can only hope that the families of his victims will find peace in knowing that he'll potentially be behind bars for the rest of his life. Let's hope that he's never given that second chance. Following the tragic events which took place behind me, this pathway has now been renamed as Nat's track in her memory. A bench in Natalie's name rests on the southern side of the track, resting next to a statue of a bag filled with 17 flowers each daisy representing and celebrating a year of her life. Natalie's name is visibly written at the entrance to her pathway, and surveillance cameras have since been installed to keep other travellers on this pathway safe. Our third and final case today is slightly different to the previous two, and will be sure to leave you with many questions and that's the puzzling disappearance of Jake Lyons. Statistically speaking, more than 96% of disappearances in Australia are eventually solved. This is much higher than America's 85%. 
but unfortunately, Jake would not fit into that number. Jake's disappearance, which happened here in the suburb of Dandenong North, was strange to say the least, and left his family riddled with confusion. And when I say that his disappearance was strange, I really do mean it. So much so, that there are now many theories as to what may have happened. Scaling back to the year 2014, Jake was a young adult who was heavily into video games. He had several friends in the area, but spent most of his hours in the day gaming or chilling in his room. His family described him as very friendly and selfless to those he loved. He also excelled in school and was known to be very intelligent. Now, despite his calm demeanor, intelligence, and prosperous future, Jake also expressed feelings of emotional detachment and depression throughout his life. But family and friends were not too worried, because Jake seemed to have it together. After all, he did have aspirations for his future, and expressed that one day he would like to join the military. However, on an average day in August of 2014, all of this changed when Jake unexpectedly disappeared. And a trail of baffling evidence left behind would confuse his loved ones and the authorities. August the 24th, 2014 began like any other day. Jake's parents made their way to work, with his mother leaving early in the morning, and his father Rick shortly after. Rick recalls nothing seeming out of the ordinary, and with this being a Sunday, Jake was expected to stay home all day. However, when Rick returned home later that day, he immediately sensed that something was wrong. To begin with, Jake's car, a 2006 Holden Astra, was missing from the driveway, and after approaching the front door, the situation became even more troubling. The front door to the property was unlocked. Venturing inside, Rick found that the gas stove in the kitchen had been left running, which was bizarre, as nobody was home. After making his way to the dining room, Rick found his son's laptop and mobile phone dismantled on the table. The situation was both concerning and highly perplexing. If Jake had planned to leave, then why didn't he take his phone with him? And why would he leave the stove running? Jake was also considered to be a responsible young man, so why did he leave the door unlocked? And furthermore, what exactly was significant about the laptop? Riddled with worry, Rick called the authorities to report his son as missing. But despite his and their best efforts, daylight faded with no response from his son. And sadly, the next few days harboured no fresh clues either. Jake's silence persisted for six gruelling long days, but as his disappearance reached the one-week mark, the police finally received a breakthrough. A 12-minute drive away from his home at the Warner Reserve in Springvale, and right here in this car park, his vehicle, which belonged to his father, was found with a couple rather peculiar details. The car remained undamaged out in the open with no signs of foul play. Furthermore, there were no signs to indicate that Jake was in any sort of rush to abandon his vehicle. Upon closer inspection, the authorities realized that the car keys were placed neatly underneath the chassis of the vehicle, indicating that Jake or his assailant were not precious about the car being stolen. With Jake's car now found, the authorities were able to determine the most likely route he would have taken to get there. With this information, they learned that he had stopped at a gas station along the way. While there, he purchased a drink and some snacks before withdrawing $50 from his bank account. And with the information available, he appeared to be alone and was of normal function. But this would be the last transaction ever to hit his bank account because after that, it was never touched again. Additionally, all of his social media accounts became entirely silent. The authorities conducted a thorough search of Warner Reserve and the surrounding area where his vehicle was found. But sadly, despite all efforts, nothing new was located. And unfortunately, Jake's case has remained cold ever since. Jake's father has expressed that, although his son did suffer from depression, he was receiving counselling at the time of his disappearance. However, he had never expressed any desire to take his own life, and had many ambitions for the future. On numerous occasions, Jake had previously expressed a desire to start a new life in the countryside. He wanted to get away from the 
city and live a more simple lifestyle. But saying that, these thoughts and ambitions did not seem to be serious at the time he expressed them. And so, this leads us to the leading theories of what may have actually happened to Jake. Some believe that his depression may have been far worse than others thought and he may, as a result, have disappeared after taking his own life. However, there are several problems to this theory. To begin with, if he had taken his life near the Warner Reserve, then his body would have almost certainly been found. Suburbs surround the park, and the closest area of wilderness is a three-hour walk away. Saying this, we should never exclude all possibilities. There is a chance that, maybe, Jake managed to make his way far enough into regional Victoria or further afar into the outback. And let's be sober with the situation here. There are a lot of places to disappear in Australia's vast wilderness. The next theory is that Jake simply ran away and didn't want to be found. The reason he dismantled both his laptop and his phone is because they are both traceable objects. He then withdrew $50 in cash, which is enough to get a ride outside of Melbourne. Jake may have disappeared to start a new life elsewhere, using the $50 to get public transport to another location. I mean, he had had already expressed a yearning to live in the countryside both to his counsellor and his father. But if that was the case, then why did he leave the front door unlocked and the stove on? Another theory is that Jake was met with foul play while walking around Warren Reserve. However, this theory holds little weight, as Jake's previous actions show some level of intention not to return. Furthermore, there were no witnesses to report foul play, he disappeared in the middle of the day, and there was no evidence to suggest any sort of altercation whatsoever. Another option is that Jake slipped into some sort of psychosis, had no idea who he was, and has since disappeared or even died with no recollection of his former life. Reddit posts are filled with potential theories, but to this day, his case still remains open. I do hope that if you are out there, Jake, that you have found peace, and that you can also bring peace to your family too. After nine long years, there are still many questions that remain unanswered, but Jake's family are hopeful that one day he will eventually return home. Jake's family have survived through nine Christmases, nine birthdays, and nine years without him. His disappearance remains puzzling to say the least, and so with that in mind, what do you think happened to Jake? Please let me know in the comments down below. It's clear to see that Melbourne is a vibrant and beautiful city filled with charm, intrigue, and damn good coffee. Regarded as one of the most cosmopolitan and multicultural cities globally, Melbourne offers a rich tapestry of arts, cuisine, shopping, sports, and leisure. However, that is not to say that it's immune to disappearance and murder. And this video serves as a stark reminder that every city conceals a dark underbelly. My journey across Melbourne allowed me to see parts of this city that I never knew existed. But the real experience for me here was found while retracing the final footsteps of this video's many victims. In the realm of true crime, many of us observe from the safety of our own homes. Shielded by screens that distance us from the harsh reality of these true stories. Physically placing myself in these locations, such as Nat's track, Jill's memorial, and Jake's last known whereabouts, was a profound experience. It's an unusual feeling when you geographically attach yourself to a case, and I feel the heavy absence of Jill, Natalie, Elizabeth, Deborah, and Jake, and I hope that their loved ones are doing okay. It's an important reminder that, no matter where you are in the world, none of us are safe from harm. We must all actively look out for each other and ourselves, and remember those who, tragically, were not so lucky. And with so many of these victims in our case today being young women, I do have to suggest that we should all be looking out for our lady friends more often. And with that said, I think I'll end today's video here, folks. Thank you so much for joining me in and around Melbourne. I hope you found this one interesting. Now, obvious to say, this video was slightly different to the usual, so with that in mind, please let me know what you think in the comments down below. I would love to make this a new series, scoping out the dark side of our cities. And although I'm currently scoping out the likes of New York, Toronto, and Tokyo, 
I have to ask, where would you like to see me go next? Thank you once again for joining me today, and as always, I'll see you very soon for another one. However, until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.